Some parents never speak to their kids about relationships. What lesson are they indirectly teaching their kids by doing so? The lesson is, if ever you have questions or problems or you need advice related to romance, don't ask me because in this family, we ignore this topic. I know you didn't say it directly, but as parents, that could be the indirect message. We ignore this topic, so don't come to me. Even worse, some parents lie to their children. You know, babies come from a stork or because parents hug each other or whatever the case people make up. What is the lesson when parents lie to their kids and their kids later on in life find out, oh, that wasn't actually true what mom and dad said? The lesson, indirectly of course, is if ever you have any questions or problems or you need any advice related to romance, just lie about it. Just lie about it. Why? Because in this family, we lie about these issues. I know you didn't teach the kid that directly, but you did teach them that indirectly. So, today I'd like to address certain aspects regarding relationships. And if you're the type of person to object to such a topic, hopefully I've responded to your objection in this introduction. Allah subhanahu wa says, بَعْدَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't approach unlawful sexual intercourse, zina, fornication. Indeed, it is an immorality and an evil way. It is forever, it will always be an evil sabil, path. Why did Allah ta'ala say that? Because it's not just the end result that's evil. It's not just the act of fornication that's evil, rather it's every step that leads up to it, whether it be the glance and the flirtation and the text message and, and, and so on and so forth. All, every one of those, sa'a each step was evil along the path. Now, of course we can tell our youth, don't get involved with flirting and dating and all this haram stuff, we can tell them that because it's wrong, because Allah said so. But it also helps to explain how it harms them. It's useful to explain the reasoning so that inshallah ta'ala, it goes in the heart easier. The basic concept here is what? Men and women generally want the same things out of a relationship. They both want the relationship to be both emotional and physical at the same time. That's a healthy relationship. However, you do find that the amount differs between men and women. In other words, it's like a Venn diagram, but the circles are not exactly on each other. There's a little bit of overlap, right? What I'm trying to say is simply put, men put a little bit more emphasis on the physical aspect women tend to put more emphasis on the emotional sides of the relationship. Now, usually, when you get involved in dating, I'm trying to speak to my younger brothers and sisters, when you get involved in this world of dating, it's going to unjustly favor one of two sides. Usually, you'll find it's not going to be fair to both. There's going to be some sort of zulm, some sort of injustice to either side. Either the boy is going to get everything that he wants, the physical aspects, He's going to be with her in a physical way, sexual way. Well, she is not getting any real commitment. She didn't get the ring. She didn't actually get any commitment. You're not working and providing for her the home and the car and so on and so forth. And so there are ter terms that people come up with for these things. What do they call that nowadays? They call that friends with benefits, a situationship. And the girl will be labeled a bunch of very unfavorable labels that I don't think it's you know, appropriate to mention as a khatib on the mimbar, but let's just say they all have to do with lewdness. These women usually get this sort of label. It's very detrimental for one's reputation. On the flip side, if the girl is getting all the attention she wants, she's enjoying talking and texting and chatting day and night and the boy is investing his emotional, he's investing himself emotionally into this relationship without getting the rights of a husband. He has no wife, he has no intimacy, he has no kids, he doesn't have an actual wife. He's just wasting his time, and most importantly, he's wasting the time in which he's supposed to be making a man out of himself. You know, late teens, early 20s. These are the crucial, critical years where you're supposed to be building yourself into a real man. And how many of our young men instead are doing what? Giving all that time to chatting with this girl, that girl, not getting anything out of it. You see how there's a vulm or an injustice on both sides? It's mostly physical, not emotional. It's mostly emotional, not physical. You feel that in both scenarios, there's being, injustice is being done. Nowadays, what do they call such a guy? That guy is in the friend zone, right? That's what they would say, the modern term. The guy who's just chatting all the time, emotionally investing in this girl, not getting anything from it. And the popular term that the kids use today, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, it's called a simp. That's what they call him these days. That is the term they like to use. Now, somebody might say, no, we're dating, and it's right down the middle. 
The young man is catering to her, her emotional needs and the young woman is catering to his physical needs. In such a case, brothers and sisters, if you're involved in such a relationship, why are you dating? Why are you dating? Just get married. You're basically already a married couple. If you are actually avoiding any sort of injustice and you are both catering to each other fully, that's called a marriage. Just get the nikah done. Why are you dancing around the issue? Just get it done. Islam teaches us this, that when you get married, spouses have rights. Simply put, the man must satisfy his wife financially and emotionally. He must be invested in this woman. And the woman must satisfy her husband physically as well. This is part of the obligations of marriage. What are the proofs from the Quran and Sunnah? There's a very, few, very beautiful hadith, lengthy hadith. I can't go through the whole hadith. About Abu Zar and Umm Zar. I, I don't know if you've ever come across this hadith. Very long. And it's very confusing at first because you know that the Prophet ﷺ is a man who has the most difficult job. He has to guide humanity. And he not only has to deal with his own personal worship, but he has to teach his followers and call the disbelievers, and he has to fight his enemies, and he has so much responsibility. And then imagine one day he comes home after a long day, maybe just wanting some peace and quiet, and his mind is preoccupied with the issues of the ummah, and then his young wife, Aisha Ranha, she comes up to him, and she starts telling this story. In the days of Jahiliyyah, there were these 11 women sitting around and all talking to each other. And you read this hadith and you're thinking, where is this story going? It's very odd. There was the first woman. She said, my husband's like this, this, and this. He has either some good qualities or some bad qualities. And she goes on. Then, and then the second woman said this. And you're reading this hadith and it's going on and on. Aisha then how she just keeps telling the Prophet all these stories about the second woman. She said this about her husband. And then the third woman, she was talking about her, you know, her husband and said, oh, well, he's like this. Something positive, something negative, whatever the case is. And the story goes on and on. It's lengthy. And then finally, number 11 is Umm Zara. And Aisha is telling the Prophet ﷺ, and then there was this woman, Umm Zara. And she said, oh, my husband, Abu Zara, he was so fantastic, and he was so great, and I loved him so much, and he was so sweet. And it goes on and on and on. And then finally at the end, you notice that the Prophet ﷺ didn't say a single word the whole time. What was he doing? Quietly listening. So lovingly let her go on. 20 minutes maybe, I don't know, if you read the whole hadith, it's long. Maybe 20 minute story, 30 minute story, Allah knows. And then finally at the end, he says what? Kuntu laki ka'abi zar'in li ummi zar'. He goes... I am for you as Abu Zara was to Umm Zara. So what does this hadith teach you? I mean, the first time I read it, I'm thinking, where's the fiqh in this? Where's the, what's, what's the lesson? I don't get what's going on here. And only later on did I come across some commentary that said, this is a beautiful hadith showing what? That even if your wife is going on and on about some story, oh, you know, this happened, that happened, and you feel like, you know, most men, most husbands, okay, okay, I'm busy, you know, okay, well, get to the point. But no, don't be short, don't be curt, don't be rude. Let her talk, be patient, listen to the whole thing, and at the end of it, say something sweet. Say something that proves that you were listening the whole time. Say something that connects it back to you two and brings you two together. It's such a beautiful hadith when you look at it from the proper lens. And of course, we know that the Prophet ﷺ also mentions what? I advise you to take good care of your women, for they are created from the rib, and the most curved portion of the rib is the upper part. So, if you try to straighten it, you're going to break it. And if you leave it alone, it's just going to stay the way it is. It's going to stay curved. So I urge you to take care of your women. You, all, you often find men, when they get married, they're like, man, I just say what I feel. I just speak directly. Everything's very straight. This is how I feel. Straight, direct. And you find that, you know, with women, it's always like, they're always trying to say things indirectly. It's like almost like curved, right? It's got this different mentality. And men struggle with this a lot. And the Prophet is saying, that's okay. She has emotionality. She deals with things in an indirect way. Sometimes it might be frustrating. If you're going to try to change a female nature, you're going to break her. It's not going to work. And if you say, oh, maybe I'll just leave it alone and be patient and she'll change eventually. Don't worry about it. It won't change. It's a bone. <laughs> it is the way it is. Just accept and cater to that emotionality and just be cool with it. So yes, as a husband, you have to be ready to cater to your wife's emotionality. And what about physicality? Sisters, what do they have to cater to? The Prophet says, إِذَا الرَّجُلُ دَعَى زَوْجَتَهُ لِحَاجَتِهِ فَالْتَأْتِهِ وَإِنْ كَانَتْ عَلَى التَّنُورِ When a man calls his wife to fulfill his needs, then let her come even if she is at the oven. This is a very interesting hadith. It really deserves a lot of appreciation. Why? Because we all know that wasting food in Islam is very much prohibited. There's no, it's not a joke. Wasting food is not a small matter. 
It's a very big deal. And yet, you can have this sister who's cooking and saying, you want me to leave the dinner? It might spoil the food, it might burn the food, something bad might happen. And yet, she's still being instructed, yes, it's important to take care of the food, but guess what? It's even more important to make sure that you respond to the man physically. Why? This is part of the responsibility of marriage. This is what's gonna keep the family together. That's how the man gets his satisfaction from the physical and the woman the emotional. And of course, there's overlap, but these are the, what is emphasized. And I think it's also important to highlight a glaring double standard. Have you ever noticed that if you pay attention to advertisements or Netflix series or songs or every movie, they always involve, anytime they involve a woman, they must sexualize her to the utmost degree. Isn't this indirectly saying that a woman is only interesting for her body? I think it is. And you'd think that this would be offensive, and yet we, t we continue to consume, talk about this entertainment with friends and family, movie after movie, series after series, song after song, without ever asking, why is the media telling us that a woman is only good for one thing? And yet today, I've stood here and pointed out the obvious fact that sexuality is clearly a big part of our lives and must therefore be taken seriously. But not as entertainment for public consumption, rather to be taken seriously as a responsibility towards the one that you chose as a spouse in the sanctity of marriage. I think this is important to strengthen our families and yet unfortunately I fear that some people may have the reaction of saying, why is this imam telling us that a woman is only good for one thing? I'm not saying that you're only good for one thing. I hope our sisters understand that. I'm simply quoting the hadith because I think this is what keeps our families together. And I'm reminding the brothers and the sisters that marriage is about responsibility. It's about responsibility. Young men, if you want to get married, then you have to get up and work throughout the day so you can provide and then come home in the evening and listen and care and be attentive to your, to your wife's feelings. Even when you don't feel like working, even if you don't feel like being sensitive, still, you have to do it. And if you can't, you're probably not ready for marriage. And on the flip side, Sisters, if you choose a husband, then you do have to respond to that man's desires, even when you don't feel like it. And if you can't, no problem. Maybe you're just not ready for marriage. That's okay, too. Now, what about our youth? Going back to our topic about our youth. Where do our youth fall on the spectrum of dating? Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah in our community, I have not heard of this widespread problem of promiscuity. Alhamdulillah, hopefully, we're not dealing with that in any sort of large scale. If it ever does happen behind the scenes, inshallah, we don't make a big deal about it, we don't have to gossip, people make tawbah, leave it alone, if there is some sort of zina or whatever the case is. But it seems to be rare and, alhamdulillah, not a big issue. However, when it comes to young men wasting countless hours, chatting all day and all night, it, unfortunately, it does seem to be the case that we do have a bit of a simping epidemic. So this does seem to be a problem. Young men, what is going on? This is a real problem. Guys spending countless hours getting nothing out of it, just chatting. Oh, really? What happened then? Really? She said that? I can't believe that. What are you doing, guys? Why are you wasting so much of your life staying up hours just chatting constantly? We need, as parents, to speak to our sons, speak to them very plainly, very directly, specifically the mothers. You know, you could speak to your sons and say, stop giving these girls attention they don't deserve. Why are you investing in these girls? They haven't given you anything back. This isn't a real relationship. You're just giving them all this attention. And I think it's very helpful for mothers to tell their sons, I know what it's like to be a young girl. I was once a young girl. You'll never know, but I do know. I think it's great if our mothers explain that you knew what it was like being younger and being so excited to get a young boy's attention. Some girls, they just want to drain that time. They enjoy the validation. They come to you with their complaints and their problems and their gossip and their feelings and you talk to them all day, all night, staying up till midnight and 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. You don't get your homework done. You get too tired to focus in school. And these are your critical years to be making yourself into a man. And the sad reality is, if these girls, oftentimes, if they really felt like it was time to get married, they probably wouldn't choose you. You know that guy that's always there, always available, just sort of hovering, orbiting guy? who's just like, hey, I'm still here, you wanna talk for like hours? Usually this guy is the last guy to get chosen. Why? Because once the sister gets serious about marriage, she realizes I need to get with the guy who's actually focused about his life. He's not spending countless hours just talking about gossip. I want the guy who is at the masjid, at the library, at the gym. Physical, mental, spiritual. Actually taking care of business, right? 
keeping himself fit, learning something, and fixing his heart. Physical, mental, spiritual. This is what creates success, insha'Allah ta'ala. And so yes, these young men, we need to talk to them and say, listen, you will be labeled recreational use only. You were great just for talking, chatting, chatting, chatting. You're not actually useful. And you'll be thrown to the side. And all you'll have is a broken heart and countless hours of your teens and early 20s wasted. Instead, sons, work hard. Find a girl that's going to honor you, respect you, give you a family. She'll make you feel like a king, and you, inshallah ta'ala, will make her feel like a queen. That's what's important. And if they entice you physically, sometimes, you know, the flirtation gets intense. If they try to entice you physically, then I think it's important to remind our young brothers that, yes, it may be the case that the wild ones are the most exciting, but they're also the most dangerous. Lots of fun in the short term, terrible in the long term. You don't believe me? Let me explain to you a beautiful lesson from the Qur'an. Throughout the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has these stories of Musa salam, and Yusuf salam, in different parts, Surah Yusuf, Surah Qasas, Surah Taha, etc. And subhanAllah, throughout the Qur'an, you find that these two stories parallel each other. It's like they're two sides of the same coin. They're always complementing each other. M- you know, the story of Yusuf salam. How did Bani Israel get into Egypt? That's Yusuf salam. How did Bani Israel get out of Egypt? Musa salam. We know this. And l- look at their stories, even from a young child. At the beginning of the st- both stories, Yusuf salam, as a child has an episode with his father. Musa salam, as a child has an episode with his mother. We all know this. They're both put into water. Yusuf salam, is put into a well, small amount of water. Musa salam, is put into a river, large amount of water. Yusuf salam, the water is still. It's not running, it's not moving. It's still. And there are many brothers that are with him, many brothers, and yet they all desert him. With Musa salam, what happens? The water is running, he is moving, and he doesn't have many brothers, he just has one sister, and she follows him. She doesn't abandon him, she runs after him. You guys see? SubhanAllah, and I could go on and on, that's just when they're kids. It keeps going and keeps going. Musa salam, and Yusuf salam, have these amazing parallels throughout the Quran, uh, throughout their stories. I don't want to go through every one, it's going to take too long. I just want to focus on one point. They both deal with women, very different women. We know that Musa salam, deals with a shy woman, right? She walks with shyness. And we know that Yusuf salam, deals with a very lewd woman, aggressive, lots of seduction, sexually aggressive type of woman. And you find that, subhanAllah, what is the result? Musa salam, deals with this shy woman who ends up getting him a job and giving him a family, giving him long-term success. A good, shy woman, she what? She built him up into a real man, subhanAllah. With Yusuf salam, he lost his job and ended up in jail. And guess what? He didn't even do anything wrong. SubhanAllah, Musa alayhi salam is the one who killed somebody and he never goes to jail. Yusuf alayhi salam, innocent, goes to jail. Isn't that crazy? SubhanAllah, this is Qur'an. And by the way, there are, unfortunately, many men, they get enticed by a beautiful, very exciting woman. And what happens? Same situation. Lose your money, lose your job, end up in jail. So, I've seen it. I'm sure many of you have seen it as well. So, a very powerful lesson from both Musa alayhi salam and Yusuf alayhi salam, many parallels we should pay attention to. Inshallah ta'ala will continue in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam sallam kathira. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa sallam ala rasulillah. So not only should we have, inshallah ta'ala, our mothers speaking to our sons, but we need our fathers to speak to the daughters as well. Please explain to your daughters. Avoid men who just want you for your body, who see you as just a good time. Same thing, recreational use only. A'udhu billah. You'll end up feeling used. You'll end up feeling very cheap. Stay away from such useless men. Find a good man that's actually built himself into a man. And I know that a lot of our sisters, they ask the question, the question that's been repeated so often is what? If I marry this guy, will I have the right to work? This is always the question that gets repeated. But subhanAllah, nowadays, as I'm speaking to sisters, I'm finding the opposite is the question being asked. The question is, do I have the right not to work? This is the big question. I mean, that's the real right, right? That's the, that's the better right. I don't have to work. It's, that's, that's fantastic. SubhanAllah, you're finding that often, more and more increasingly, you're finding that the answer is no. It's very rough out there for sisters. I was speaking to a group of sisters, and they're saying that they're facing a generation of men that they're, you know, they've been raised on the feminist ideology. They believe in gender equality. And so they are the type of guys that say, hey, if I'm working a 40-hour week, you better be working a 40-hour week as well. Right? That's, that's the indoctrination. We're all equal. 40 hours, 40 hours. It is what it is. So yeah, subhanAllah, I don't understand how it is the case. 
that a lot of young men these days, they don't have that classic sense of ghira, protective jealousy. They don't mind the idea of their wife going to work and being yelled at by the boss and this boss literally bossing her around. Get up, hey, why are you late? What are you doing? Redo this report, it's no good. Fix it, this and that. I mean, alhamdulillah, the classic concept of masculinity, sense of ghira, is that, hey, no one's gonna be talking to my wife that way. No, I'm gonna take care of you. This guy's not gonna be yelling at you and t criticizing you and, no, 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 I'm not gonna allow that. You're my wife, I'm gonna work, I'll deal with these frustrating bills and stuff, I'm gonna take care of you, no one's gonna be yelling at you. This is the classic idea. But subhanAllah, nowadays sisters have a very rough situation because the vast majority of men, according to what these sisters are telling me, they don't want that. They want equality. So be cautious out there and you have to ask the right questions. You have to ask the right questions with regards to getting a spouse. We need our fathers to prepare them. Asking the right questions about family issues, money dynamics, health issues in the family. Maybe in your past there were some sort of diseases. These are questions that most people don't get into. There's lots of questions that need to be taught and our fathers need to get more involved in the process. They need to get more involved in not only highlighting the positive aspects they see in their daughter, but also being honest and saying, you have negative qualities as well. In fact, you might have negative qualities that would have disqualified you from my consideration had I been a young man. The way you talk, the way you talk back, your, the, your focus in life, your lack of deen, all these things. If as, a, if as a father, you know, I would have never taken you as an option. I, you know, the only reason I'm with your mother is because she has so many of the opposite qualities. If that's the case, in the nicest way possible, you need to communicate this. You need to communicate this to your sons, but also to your daughters. So, I know that there are many different expressions, some that highlight, you know, that are favoring the woman, they say, happy wife, happy life. Some that favor the men that say, happy husband, we ain't fussing. And some that's just about me, whether you're male or female, happy me, happy we. Some people have these expressions, but as the believer, you wanna focus on your spouse. Happy spouse, happy house. This is the attitude that we want to maintain, inshallah ta'ala. And, we know that once a marriage is developed, there is a very interesting uh, theory by John uh, Gottman. He has the five to one magic ratio. I don't think you have to take this as fact, but I still think it's very important to realize. Certain, a very important idea that is, is communicated. This is somebody who studied marriage for many years and studied how people get divorced and so on and so forth. He said that the magic ratio is if, as long as you have five positive interactions against one negative, inshallah, your relationship should be okay. The moment it starts getting less than that, only four positive to one, three to one, two to one, or half and half, the moment the, the positive and negative interactions between a husband and a wife starts to go down, underneath the five to one ratio, you can expect a divorce. So I think this is very, very important to keep in mind. Final few points, inshallah ta'ala. If you're struggling to get married, I know many young people are struggling and they're worried about this. I want to remind you of a hadith of the Prophet he says something very beautiful. If you have these four qualities, you're not going to worry about anything that you miss in this dunya. So if you didn't get married, if you're worried, if you're frustrated, don't worry. Inshallah, you'll be okay. What are these four qualities? Number one, that you are somebody who fulfills their trusts. Trustworthy. Number two, you're honest, truthful in speech. Number three, you have good character. And number four, you have restraint when it comes to food. You know how to hold back. You're not gluttonous. If you have these four qualities, you're reliable, you're honest, you got good character, and you know how to control your base desires. You're not just, you know, uh, controlled by your desires. Then in Shalatada, you should be okay. So that's my reminder to the brothers. And I also remind you that Ramadan is just around the corner. And Ramadan is not just about developing, getting closer to Allah Ta'ala through ibadah. In addition to that, Ramadan is about cutting ties with your haram relationships so you can develop your good relationship with your Lord. In or, you can't just say to yourself, I'll just have a mess of a situation and throw some ibadah on top of it. No, the objective of Ramadan is to try to remove some of that evil and then of course supplement it with good. The Prophet tells us, That indeed, you're never going to leave something for the sake of Allah, except that Allah is going to replace that thing with something better than it for you. It's a beautiful hadith. So if you're involved in some sort of a haram relationship, 
If you're involved in some sort of a dating situation, if you're dealing with a uh, uh, illicit romantic partnership, leave it for the sake of Allah and may Allah Ta'ala replace it. Inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will replace it for you. Ya Allah, we ask you to protect our kids from haram relationships and to bless them with righteous spouses and righteous offspring. Ya Allah, we ask you to stay away from the temptation of zina and haram and falling into evil. Ya Rab, we ask you to be righteous towards our spouses, giving and fulfilling their, 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 uh, their uh, rights. And Ya Allah, we ask you to help us to cater to each other both physically and emotionally. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man aafayt wa tawallana fi man tawallayt wa barik lana fi ma aatayt wa khina sharra ma qadayt fa innaka taqdi wa la yuqda alayk innahu la yadhillu man walayt wa la ya'izzu man aadayt tabarakta rabbana wa ta'alayt rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina a'adhaab al-nar wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam 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 s